Chapter 14. Case Studies. It Could Happen to You. In this final set of supernatural case studies, please note that none of the people you read about here tried to make anything happen. They simply had an intention and at the same time surrendered the outcome to something greater. When they hit that moment, whether it was a healing or a mystical experience, their personality wasn't creating the experience. Something greater came through them and did it for them. They connected to the unified field, and it was their interaction with this intelligence that moved them in some way. As you know by now, after everything you have read in this book, that intelligence also lives within you. Divine, can you hear me? In 2014, Stacy began experiencing severe headaches. For 25 years, she had worked in healthcare as both a registered nurse and an acupuncturist. She had always maintained a healthy lifestyle and rarely took medications, so the sudden appearance of headaches so excruciating they nearly caused her to black out was alarming. After a year of exploring countless alternative therapies, she finally went to a doctor who ordered a CAT scan. The diagnosis was a meningioma, a benign tumor that wraps around certain nerve tissue in the spinal nerves. Stacy's was sitting on or near her eighth cranial nerve, which began obstructing her acoustic nerve and creating significant changes in her neurological functions. The acoustic nerve has two branches, one for hearing and the other for balance. So, in addition to unrelenting pain and loss of hearing, she was dizzy and nauseated. As the lesion grew, it also began pushing against another cranial nerve that ran along her face and continued down into her shoulder, resulting in a diagnosis of Pitcher's shoulder. Soon, she also experienced pain in her eye. According to her physician, the only solution was a craniotomy, which basically entailed drilling a large hole in the back of her head to remove the tumor. Stacy did not want to pursue this path, so she continued exploring other healing modalities. By the time she attended her first weekend workshop in Seattle in 2015, she estimated she had lost 70% of her hearing in her left ear. In the fall of 2016, she attended her first advanced workshop in Cancun, where she felt herself surrender at a whole new level. Then, in the winter of 2017, she attended another advanced workshop in Tampa. Upon arrival on Thursday, she had a very intense earache that became much worse the next day. She said the sensation she felt was that her ear was closing up. By the end of that day, after the blessing of the Energy Center's meditation, her earache curiously ended. Then on Sunday morning, during the pineal gland meditation, Stacy lost track of time and space. I almost felt like I was going to fall off my chair, she said. In that moment, this amazing flash of light consumed the left side of my head. Imagine if you put a thousand diamonds together and shined a light on them. That wouldn't even begin to touch this light. Then, boom! Her body shot upright and a bluish-white light, like nothing she had ever seen or experienced, entered her ear. It was the most divine, loving feeling that I've ever had, she reported. I felt like the hand of God was caressing me with grace. It was so powerful and amazing that I struggled to put it into words, but every time I think of it, I still cry. First her sinuses cleared, then the whole left side of her head cleared, and then her left shoulder relaxed and let go. Finally, for the first time in three years, she could hear out of her left ear. I just sat there in awe, laughing and crying as tears flowed down my face, she said. Music was playing, and I could hear it crystal clear. It was as if I could hear the celestial sound of angels singing above the song. I knew that what I was hearing was beyond the normal auditory range. The energy continued to move through the back of the left side of my head, which for years had felt like cement. When I instructed everyone to lie down, relax, and let the autonomic nervous system take the orders, the energy continued to move through Stacy's whole body, down her arms, and into her hands. She began to shake uncontrollably. It was as if I could feel every synapse and muscle in my body firing, in my toes, my legs, my head and my neck and chest. My heart center felt wide open. I just remember thinking, whatever this is, I'm taking the ride. She completely surrendered to the unknown and once again she lost track of time and space. When that portion of the meditation ended, she found herself sitting in her chair 
with the energy slowing and quieting down. Her thinking brain began to kick in. Even though she could hear, she began to doubt what had just occurred. Perhaps her ear was not totally healed. Perhaps the tumor was still present. Or perhaps she wasn't even worthy of healing. No sooner did she have that thought than the energy and light appeared in front of her. But this energy was different. It was red like the heart and blue like energy, and it was three-dimensional, she remembered. It was about two feet in front of me and was almost slithering like a snake. All this was happening with my eyes closed. It was multi-dimensional, beautiful, crazy, gorgeous, fractal, and it came right up to my face. It was almost as if this energy wanted to say, You have doubts? We'll show you. Then it shot into my heart. My chest opened up. I sat back on the chair, and my arms fell wide open. I knew it was the energy of everything, the energy of chi, of spirit, of the divine, of the universe. Life is different now, she told me. For one, my hearing is at a hundred percent. But it's more than that. It's hard to put into words. But I know that no matter what, I'm going to be okay. Life will never be the same because I know underneath everything, it's spirit who is looking to be heard and healed. Janet Hears, You Are Mine While Janet occasionally meditated, it was never a regular habit. Yet one afternoon, 25 years ago, during a meditation, she had what she calls a spontaneous experience. With her eyes closed, she was suddenly in the presence of an incredibly bright light, yet the light had a softness that didn't hurt her eyes. She described it as the purest, most intense, perfect love she had ever experienced. For the next 25 years, she prayed, meditated, and did everything else she could to try to recreate that transcendental experience. In the spring of 2015, Janet attended an advanced workshop in Carefree, Arizona. She was in a state of deep depression and exhaustion, unable to see any solutions to the problems in her life, yet she was determined to have a healing or breakthrough. Above all else, she was excited to be with more than 500 people, united in the belief that they were greater than their physical bodies. For the duration of the workshop, Janet went out to the mystical with a level of intensity that was greater than her depression. During the pineal gland meditation, she was sitting in the lotus position and resting her loving intention in the space of her pineal gland. All of a sudden, the gland activated and a brilliant white light coming from inside her head, illuminated her pineal gland. It was the same light she had experienced 25 years earlier. The light came into the space of my pineal gland and illuminated all of the crystals in that little cave of that tiny gland, she later explained. The light continued to illuminate my entire being down to the cellular level. My spine then straightened, my head went back, and I just embraced it. I just let it all happen. I was simultaneously in ecstasy, bliss, gratitude, and love. Next, an inverted triangle of light came down from above her, through the top of her head. She knew this triangle was the presence of a loving intelligence. The point of the inverted triangle joined the peak of her pineal gland, forming a double geometric shape. The intense frequency of coherent light was carrying a message for Janet. The light kept saying to Janet over and over, You are mine. You are mine, which she took to mean, I love you more than anything else in the world. Please enter and take charge of my life, Janet responded, and as she surrendered to it, she started to experience a download of information coming through the top of her head in the form of the brilliant light. The light was threaded with strands that looked like luminous cobalt blue pearls. The light moved slowly and descended through her entire body. This energy was the result of a reverse torus field, the field that moves in the opposite direction of the upward field created during the breath. And it was energy from the unified field, from beyond the visible light spectrum and beyond our senses. The inner experience was so real that it rewired her brain and sent a new emotional energetic signal to her body. And in an instant, her past was washed away. The download of the frequency of coherence and wholeness gave her body a biological upgrade. By the time she left the workshop, her depression and her exhaustion were completely gone. This ecstatic experience, she insisted, has changed my life forever.
connected beyond time and space by love. During a Project Coherence meditation broadcast from Lake Garda, Italy, participants from all over the world joined us in the belief that we are more than just matter, bodies and particles, and that consciousness influences matter and the world. During the meditation, Sasha was in New Jersey visualizing bringing the earth into her heart. When we went to the heart, I felt all these shoots and leaves growing from my heart center and through my body, she told me. There were branches, leaves and blossoms coming out of my arms, fingers and ears, as well as white blossoms all over my face. I had literally become the surface of the earth garden. As soon as the meditation was over, Sasha looked down at her phone and saw that her best friend, Heather, had sent her a picture from Ireland. While we had been doing the meditation, Heather had been walking through a garden. She happened to look down and saw moss growing on a rock in the shape of a heart. Heather took a picture of the moss with her phone and sent it to Sasha with a note that says, Saw this and had the overwhelming feeling of your presence. Love you. Donna helps souls cross over. When Donna attended her first weekend workshop in 2014 in Long Beach, California, she never would have called herself a meditator. She'd only meditated a handful of times before. A technical writer, she had a very analytical mind. But that's the beauty of this work. When you have no expectations, you are often more open to wherever the experience takes you. So she was totally taken by surprise when at some point during one of her meditations that weekend, she slipped out of her everyday consciousness and found herself surrounded by hundreds of interdimensional beings. They weren't angry or malevolent, she told me, but it was very clear to me that they wanted something from me. Some of them were fairly young, like 12 or 13. I knew immediately that they were the people my fiancé had killed. Donna was engaged to a former United States Army Ranger, and during his service in Iraq, he had been a sniper. When Donna returned home from the workshop and told her fiancé about her experience, he confirmed that some of the people he killed to protect his fellow soldiers were quite young. While she found the connection curious and fascinating, she didn't know what to do with the information. But there was no question in her mind that the experience was real because it was beyond anything she could have simply conjured. Two years later, Donna was at an advanced workshop in Carefree, Arizona. After completing the first meditation, she turned to a friend sitting next to her and said in a daze, without even being aware of what she was saying, there are beings in this room and they are here to help us. Early Sunday morning for the pineal gland meditation, Donna was slated to have her brain scanned. Once again, at some point during the meditation, Donna found herself suddenly in the company of the same interdimensional beings who had surrounded her during her first workshop two years earlier. But this time they were standing in a line off to her right. Again, I felt like they wanted something from me, but I didn't know what it was, she said. Then, in my mind's eye, as though I was looking through a virtual reality headset, I saw another line forming on my left. There were two types of beings in this line. One type looked human-like, but they were very large and had a shimmering golden look, and the other type seemed to have a blue hue to them. She innately knew that if she took the people who were killed by her fiancé in the war, who were lined up on the right, and gave them to the beings on the left, the people on the right would receive what they needed. Because the people who had been killed by sniper fire had died so suddenly without any warning, some were confused about whether they were alive or dead. Some weren't sure where to go or what to do, while others were trying to stay in this dimension because they were attached to their loved ones and couldn't move on. They were stuck in between matter and light, yet somehow they recognized that Donna was the bridge or the facilitator who could help them cross over. And it was all happening in a very real, very lucid experience. To say I handed them over to the other beings is not quite right, she explained, but it was something like me passing them over. It's really beyond language, but when they passed to the other side, it seemed like they passed through the other beings, and then I could see them running across a field of waist-high red mist. I could feel all the freedom, joy, and happiness they were experiencing as they ran across this field. Again, as if looking through a virtual reality headset, Donna turned to the right in her mind's eye and saw a winding dirt road filled with people stretching far into the distance. She sensed they were from Bosnia and Serbia, which she couldn't quite make sense of. It felt almost as if the word got out. I didn't have the sense that they were unaware they were dead, 
It was more like they were stuck in limbo. They didn't know how to get to the other side. This was the longest meditation of the workshop, perhaps two to three hours. But to Donna, it seemed like it was ten minutes. Donna attended another advanced workshop in Cancun in the fall of 2016. This time, when I asked the students to surrender their consciousness to merge with the consciousness of the unified field, Donna had the experience of becoming the universe. She went from the consciousness of somebody, something, someone, somewhere, in some time, to the consciousness of nobody, no thing, no one, nowhere, in no time, to the consciousness of everybody, everything, everyone, everywhere, in every time. In the instant her consciousness connected with the unified field, the field of information that governs the laws and forces of the universe, she became the universe. She was in bliss. Since that experience, my life has become magical and I'm experiencing a new energy and vitality like never before, she reported later. I keep having one powerful experience after another and I can never go back to the way my life was before starting to practice this work. Jerry returns from the brink of death. On August 14, 2015, Jerry was putting a project together on his back deck. As he was reading the directions, he felt a sudden, sharp pain right below his sternum. He thought perhaps it was gas, so he took some medication, but it didn't go away. Instead, he lay down to rest, and it got worse. By the time he tried to get up, he started losing his ability to stand, and thought he might pass out. As the pain became more intense and his breathing grew shorter, he called an ambulance. With all his might, he dragged himself about 15 feet outside to the driveway so the paramedics wouldn't have to kick in his door. Kneeling on the driveway, he collapsed, waiting for the emergency medical technicians. When they arrived, they assumed he was having a heart attack and immediately began to follow that protocol. You guys don't understand. I'm having a really hard time breathing, he told them. We have to get to the hospital right away. Jerry knew what he was talking about. He'd worked for 34 years as a medical technician in the very emergency room where they were about to take him. Jerry knew everyone in the ER, and once he arrived, doctors, nurses, technicians, and specialists began frantically running lab work on him. When a doctor who was also Jerry's friend told Jerry that red flags had come up in every test administered, Jerry knew things were not looking good. One test in particular was particularly alarming. His levels of protease, amylase and lipase, enzymes produced by the pancreas, were 4,000 to 5,000 units per litre, way above the norm of about 100 to 200. They put Jerry in the intensive care unit. The pain soon worsened and none of the drugs they were giving me worked, Jerry said. They told me that a duct to my gallbladder had been blocked and it was causing trouble in my pancreas. Worst of all, fluid started to develop in my lungs. I was now down to 80% breathing capacity in both lungs. That's when the doctors put me on a ventilator and I knew things were bad. The doctor then asked his team to turn on the TV to Boston allowing the doctor to have an immediate teleconference with other doctors in a larger hospital in the nearest big city. In all the time I'd worked at the hospital, I'd only seen the TV to Boston come on a few times for the most serious of traumas or for people who were dying, Jerry said. It means they have no idea what is happening. When a doctor you have trusted for years tells you they don't know what's going on, well, that's when my stress hormones started to kick into high gear. While all of this was happening, the medical staff told Jerry's wife that if there was any end-of-life paperwork she needed to get in order, now would be the time to go home and get it. She left, sobbing. Jerry soon realized he needed to start taking care of himself. He knew that if he allowed the stress hormones to start taking over, he was not going to win. I went from being a guy who hadn't been sick in years, who did yoga all the time and ate well, to all of a sudden being in the ICU. I kept telling myself, I can't go down this road. I can't give in to the fear. So I didn't. Since he'd recently read my book, You Are the Placebo, he started thinking, I gotta change these thought patterns. I can't allow these thoughts to make more cortisol to get into the body and start doing more damage to what's left of me. The doctors eventually found out that Jerry had a large mass blocking a duct in his pancreas. The mass was not letting the mucus drain, so everything in the gland was backing up and spilling over into his bloodstream. 
My doctors stayed with me for three days straight, he says. They put an oxygen mask on me because I couldn't breathe. I had IVs on both sides, and meanwhile I kept thinking, watch your thoughts, relax, put something into the quantum field that's going to help you and not hurt you, because you're already knocking on the door. I'm gonna be okay. This too shall pass. I'm gonna be all right. Whenever he was conscious, Jerry placed his energy on overcoming himself, changing his state of being, and creating a different outcome constantly tuning in to a different potential in the unified field. Fortunately, he had a private room, giving him plenty of opportunity to do his meditations whenever he wanted to. Jerry spent a week in the ICU, and by the end of that time, when he moved to a progressive care unit, the oxygen mask was gone and Jerry was walking around. Even so, he could not eat or drink anything for nine weeks. If he ate anything or even had water, his pancreas would release acid into his body, eventually killing him. The only nourishment he received was through an IV. When Jerry was admitted to the hospital, he weighed 145 pounds. When he was discharged, he weighed 119. When he finally went home, still with an IV pole, he continued to do the work. As October drew near, the mass was still present. His doctors suggested he see a specialist in Boston to undergo surgery. Because Jerry was a medical professional, Two days before the surgery, he suggested his medical team take some more tests and scans so the doctors would have the most up-to-date information. I know all the x-ray technicians, and yet when they told me I no longer had a mass, I didn't believe them. I called in the radiologists and the doctors. They just kept saying, Jerry, we're looking at your film right now. We're telling you there's nothing there. I'm calling the guys in Boston to tell them there will be no surgery. Jerry later realized that by constantly raising his energy, moving into a feeling of health and changing the thoughts and beliefs that he was sick to the thoughts and beliefs he was going to be fine, the higher frequency caused him to heal. I wasn't going to allow myself to think, woe is me, this is going to be bad. I kept working on this every day, for as much of the day as I could. I put the right message, intention and energy out into the quantum field to heal myself, and eventually, I did. Afterward being peace. What I hope you take away from this book is that it's not enough to change your state of being only when you meditate. It's not sufficient to just think and feel peace with your eyes closed and then open them and carry on throughout the day in limited, unconscious states of mind and body. In many of the peace gathering projects and studies mentioned in Chapter 13, when the experiments concluded, very often the reduced violence and crime returned to their former baseline levels. This means that we actually have to demonstrate peace, which requires us to get our bodies involved, and that means we have to move from thinking to doing. Every time we change our state of being and begin our day by opening our hearts to the elevated states that connect us to a love for life, a joy for existence, the inspiration to be alive, a state of gratitude that our future has already happened, and a level of kindness toward others, we must carry, maintain, and demonstrate that energy and state of being throughout the day, whether we are sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Then when upsetting events occur in our lives or in the world, if we demonstrate peace rather than unconsciously act in predictable, so-called natural reactionary ways, expressing anger, frustration, violence, fear, suffering, or aggression, we are no longer contributing to the world's old consciousness. By breaking that cycle, and demonstrating peace by example, we give others permission to do the same. Because knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body, when we move from thinking to doing and experience the corresponding emotions of peace and inner balance, the moment we begin to embody peace is when we really begin to change the program. By tempering those reactive behaviors and thus no longer creating the same redundant experiences and emotions, we no longer fire and wire the same circuits in the brain. This is how we cease conditioning the body to live in the self-limiting emotions of the mind, and this is how we change ourselves and our relationship to the world around us. Every time we do this, we are literally teaching our body to chemically understand what our mind has intellectually understood. This is how we select and instruct the latent genes that cause us to thrive, not just survive. Now peace is within us, and we are knocking on the genetic door to biologically become exactly that. 
Isn't that what every great charismatic leader, saint, mystic, and master throughout history has continually preached? Of course it's going to feel unnatural in the beginning to go against years of automatic conditioning, unconscious habits, reflexive emotional reactions, hardwired attitudes, and generations of genetic programming, but that is exactly how we become supernatural. To do what feels unnatural means going against how we have all been genetically programmed or socially conditioned to live when we are threatened in some way. I'm sure any creature that has broken from the consciousness of the tribe, the pack, the school, or the herd in order to adapt to a changing environment must have felt the discomfort and uncertainty of the unknown. But let's not forget that living in the unknown means that we are in the realm of possibility. The real challenge is not to return to the level of mediocrity that the prevailing social consciousness agrees on merely because we don't see anyone else doing what we are doing. True leadership never needs confirmation from others. It just requires a clear vision and a change in energy, that is, a new state of being, that is sustained for a long enough period of time and executed with a strong enough will that it causes others to raise their own energy and become inspired to do the same. Once they do raise themselves from their own limited state of being to a new energy, they see the same future that their leader sees. There is power in numbers. After all my years of teaching people about personal transformation, I know no one changes until they change their energy. In fact, when someone is truly engaged in change, they are less likely to talk about it and more prone to demonstrate it. They are working on living it. This requires awareness, intent, staying present, and constant attention to their inner states. Perhaps the biggest hurdle is not only being uncomfortable, but also being okay with being uncomfortable, because discomfort is our challenge to grow. It makes us feel more alive. After all, if stress and the survival response are the result of not being able to predict our future, thinking or believing that we are unable to control an outcome or that things are going to get worse, then opening our minds and hearts to believe in possibility requires going against thousands of years of genetically hardwired survival traits. We must lay down the very thing that we have always used to get what we want for something much better to occur. To me, that's true greatness. If we can do it once, disturb those neural networks equated with anger, resentment and retribution, and instead activate the neural networks related to experiences of caring, giving and nurturing, and so create the corresponding emotions, then we should be able to do it again. And the repetition of these choices will neurochemically condition our mind and body to become one. When the body knows how to do this, as well as the mind, it becomes innate, familiar, easy, and second nature. Then thinking and demonstrating peace, which once required focused awareness, becomes a subconscious program. Now we've created a new, automatic, peaceful state of being. And again, that means that now peace is within us. This is how we memorize a new internal neurochemical order that's greater than any conditions in our external environment. Now we're not just being peace, but mastering it, as well as mastering ourselves and our environment. Once enough of us can achieve this state of being, once everybody is locked into the same energy, frequency, and elevated consciousness, just like schools of fish or flocks of birds moving as one in a unified order, we'll begin to act as one mind and emerge as a new species. But if we continue to act as a cancerous organism at war with itself, our species will not survive, and evolution will continue its grand experiment. Take time out of your busy life to invest in yourself, because when you do, you are investing in your future. If your familiar environment is controlling how you think and feel, it's time to retreat from your life and go inward so you can reverse the process of being a victim of life and instead become a creator of it. After reading this book, by now you know that it's possible to change yourself from within and that when you do, it will be reflected in your outer world. This is a time in history when it's not enough to simply know. This is a time to know how. According to the philosophical understanding and scientific principles of quantum physics, neuroscience and epigenetics, we now understand that our subjective mind influences the objective world. Because mind influences matter, we are compelled to study the nature of mind. Our understanding then allows us to assign meaning to what we're doing. 
If knowledge is the precursor to experience, then the more knowledge we have about how powerful we are, as well as understanding the science behind how things work, the more we can understand the limitlessness of our potential, both as individuals and as a collective. Because we are constantly deepening and broadening our understanding of the interconnectedness of all living systems, and because each of us is a contributor to the Earth's field, I believe we can collectively create and guide a new, peaceful, and prosperous future upon this planet. It all begins by making a habit of practicing leading with our hearts, raising our energy, and tuning in to greater information and frequencies of love and wholeness. With effort and intention, we should begin to produce a coherent electromagnetic signature. Just like dropping pebbles in a still lake over and over, as we continue to raise our energy and open our hearts, we're producing bigger and bigger electromagnetic fields. This energy is information, and we each have the power to direct our energy with intention to produce non-local effects on the nature of reality. When we direct our energy as an observer, a consciousness, or a thought, we can begin to affect a downward causation of matter. In other words, we can literally make our minds matter. When we practice these concepts on a consistent basis, changing our levels of energy from survival states to greater levels of awareness, compassion, love, gratitude, and other elevated emotions, these coherent electromagnetic signatures entrain to one another. The effect should then be that we can unify communities that were once separated by the belief that we are just matter. Once we transition our state of being from survival into love, gratitude, and creation, then instead of reacting to violence, terrorism, fear, prejudice, competition, selfishness, and separation, which by the way, the media, commercials, video games, and all types of stimulation are constantly reminding and programming us to live within, we can come together during crisis. We will have no further need for splintering, assigning blame, or seeking revenge. Every time we meditate as a global community, we're casting a larger, stronger, coherent wave of love and altruism around the world. If we do this enough times, we should be able to not only measure the changes in energy and frequency around the world, but measure our efforts by the positive changes in the events that take place in our future. To stand up for justice and peace, then, you must first find peace within yourself. You must then demonstrate peace to others, which means you can't make a stand for peace or be peace while you're warring with your neighbor, hating your co-worker or judging your boss. If everybody, and I mean everybody, chose peace, and if we came together at the exact same time, imagine the type of positive change we could create in our collective future. There would be no conflict. What's equally powerful is that when we are the living embodiment of peace, we show up as unpredictable to others, and then they pay attention. Thanks to mirror neurons, a special class of brain cells that fire when we see someone perform an action, we are biologically wired to mimic each other's behavior. Modeling peace, justice, love, kindness, care, understanding, and compassion allows others to open their hearts and move from fearful, aggressive states of survival to feeling wholeness and connectedness. Think what would happen if we all understood how interconnected we were to one another and to the field, rather than feeling separated and isolated. We might actually begin to take responsibility for our thoughts and emotions because we would finally understand our state of being affects all of life. This is how we begin to change the world, by first changing ourselves. The future of humanity does not rest on one person, leader, or messiah with a greater consciousness to show us the way. Rather, it requires the evolution of a new collective consciousness because it is through the acknowledgement and application of the interconnectedness of human consciousness that we can change the course of history. While it appears old structures and paradigms are collapsing, we should not face this with fear, anger, or sadness, because this is the process by which evolution and new things occur. Instead, we should face the future with a whole new light, energy, and consciousness. As I have mentioned, the old has to fall apart and fall away before something new flourishes. Integral to this process is not squandering our energy by emotionally reacting to leaders or people in power. When they capture our emotions, they capture our attention, and thus, they have captured our energy. This is how people gain power over us. Instead, we must make a stand for principles, values, and moral imperatives like freedom, justice, truth, and equality. 
When we achieve this through the power of the collective, we will unite behind the energy of oneness rather than be controlled by the idea of separation. This is when standing up for truth is no longer personal, but through unifying and building community becomes universal. I believe we are on the verge of a great evolutionary jump. Another way to say it is that we are going through an initiation. After all, isn't an initiation a rite of passage from one level of consciousness to another? And isn't it designed to challenge the fabric of who we are so we can grow to a greater potential? Maybe when we see, remember and awaken to who we truly are, human beings can move as a collective consciousness from a state of surviving into a state of thriving. It's then that we can emerge into our true nature and fully access our innate capacity as human beings, which is to give, to love, to serve, and to take care of one another and the earth. So why not ask yourself every day, what would love do? This is who we really are, and this is the future I'm creating, one in which each and every one of us becomes supernatural.